Sinclair Vehicles Limited, was a company formed in March 1983, by Sir Clive Sinclair as a focus for his work in the field of electric vehicles. An idea Clive had thought about nearly 30 years before in the 1950s, whilst he was at school, a proposal for electric-assisted inventions. The initial investment was £8.6 million which came from the proceeds of the sale of some of Sir Clive's shares in Sinclair Research. Barry Wills, formerly of the DeLorean Motor Company, was appointed as managing director. Although he initially expressed skepticism about the viability of an electric vehicle, his 25 years in the motor industry had convinced him that an electric car was never going to happen. Sinclair managed to convince him that the project would work. Sinclair had originally considered producing the C5 at the DeLorean plant at Dunmurray in Northern Ireland. This was not to be, as the DeLorean Motor Company failed in a controversial bankruptcy that resulted in the plant's closure. Instead, the work of assembling the C5 was given to the Hoover Company in the spring of 1983, at their washing machine factory at Merthyr Tydville, in Wales. Might look space age, but in fact it's extremely simple. These are all the parts. It's powered by this, a modified washing machine motor. And it's got all plastic gearing, which is normal in hand tools, but not normally in electric vehicles. There's no suspension, although the two ends of this Y-shaped chassis do give a little to absorb the bumps. You definitely don't need an electronics degree to service it. In fact, that's going to be done at home by a washing machine engineer. Hoover to make the engine for you. No, that, that's, that's a fallacy. The, 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 the engine oh. was not made by Hoover. The vehicle was assembled by Hoover. Oh, I see, because it does say yeah. manufactured by Hoover. I thought, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's not the motor. No. Oh, I see. Oh. I assume they had a sort of, uh, I don't know, washing machine with, with <laughs> sort of vibration problems and they just turned it into one of these. <laughs> Full production began in November 1984, and by early January 1985, over 2,500 C5s had been manufactured. Each production line could produce 50 vehicles an hour, and Hoover were capable of producing up to 8,000 C5s per week. The news of Sinclair's C5 project came as a surprise when it became public and attracted considerable interest, as well as skepticism. The economist asked, can a man who has made a fortune out of calculators and computers, and could double it on flat-screen televisions, be that crazy? The C5 was launched on the 10th of January 1985 at Alexandra Palace in North London. The event was staged in Sinclair's usual glitzy style. The C5 would be available, initially by mail order, at a cost of £399 and then sold via high street stores. The press was given an opportunity to try out the C5s but this proved, what they called it, an unqualified disaster. A large number of the demonstration machines did not work, the journalists soon discovered. Various reports ranged from it had travelled five yards outdoors when everything stopped, and it rolled to a halt with all the stationary decisiveness of a mule. One had a flat battery after only seven minutes, while your computer found that the C5 could not cope with the slopes at Alexandra Palace. The 250 watt electric motor which drives one of the back wheels, proved incapable of powering the C5 without using pedal power, and making a peep peep noise signalling that the engine had overheated. The timing and location of the launch event, in the middle of winter, on the top of a snow and ice covered hill, later prompted criticism even from Sinclair executives, who admitted off the record that spring conditions might have been better for a vehicle with so little protection from the British climate. A common concern was that it was simply too vulnerable in congested traffic. On a sharp turn it too easily lifts a rear wheel, is hazardously silent, and low down. It disappears below a car driver's sight line when pulling up alongside. 
The prospect of these vehicles merging into heavy traffic, dwarfed by heavy lorries, buses, and cars, is worrying. Their low speed risks turning them into mobile chicanes for other traffic. And of course you could always have one of my new C5s. Where? Down there. What is it? An invalid car. But I'm not an invalid. I haven't driven it yet. <laughs> the verdict from motoring organizations, road safety groups, and consumer watchdogs, was decidedly negative and probably sealed the C5's fate. The British Safety Council tested the C5 at Sinclair Vehicles headquarters in Warwick and issued a highly critical report to its 32,000 members. Sinclair was furious and announced that he would sue the BSC and its chairman, James Ty, for defamation. Ty told the press, I am shattered that within a few days, 14-year-old children will be allowed to drive on the road in this doodle bug, without a license, without insurance and without any form of training. Several years later, Ty was happy to take responsibility for the C5's failure, describing himself as the man entirely to blame for the failure of it. Despite the problems of the launch day, a more positive response was expected from the 20,000 members of the public who attended the remaining two days of the launch event to try out the C5 on the Alexandra Palace test track. Sinclair reported the day after the event that its switchboard had been overwhelmed by inquirers, and it expected that all 2,700 units from the first production run would be sold by the following Monday. Setting a pattern that would be repeated throughout the C5's short commercial life, this prediction was wildly optimistic, less than 200 were sold during the event. However, sales picked up as mail order forms, which had been sent to all of Sinclair's computer customers, were returned with fresh orders. Within four weeks, 5,000 had been sold. Although the C5 reached retail stores at the start of March 1985, sales had tailed off, only 8,000 had been sold by July. Retailers attempted to deal with unsold stocks of C5s. Comet first reduced the price to £259.90 but by the end of the year was selling C5s with a complete set of accessories for only £139.99. Production was terminated in August 1985, by which time 14,000 C5s had been assembled. On 19 September 85, Sinclair Vehicles changed its name to TPD Limited, with a direct subsidiary named Sinclair Vehicles Sales Limited continuing to sell C5s. TPD only lasted until 15 October, when it was placed into receivership. The receivers announced that 4,500 C5s had been sold by Sinclair Vehicles, with another 4,500 remaining in the company's hands. £7.75 million was reportedly owed to creditors, of which £7 million was owed to Sir Clive Sinclair himself in reflection of his personal investment in the project. Despite its lack of commercial success when it was first released, the C5 gained an unexpected degree of cult status in the later years. Collectors began purchasing them as investment items, reselling them for considerably more than their original retail cost. One such investor, Adam Harper, bought 600 C5s from a film company as a speculative investment in 1987. He sold all but four within two years, selling them to customers who wanted a novel, or more environmentally friendly form of transportation. I'm going to meet a real-life C5 engineer from the 80s. Can Adam Harper turn me into a believer? Now let's start with the battery, which I gather is, is a third of, of the weight of the, the entire vehicle. But it is a special battery. It's uh, designed to be recharged many, many times. Right, let's move on to this item here, which to me looks like a small washing machine motor. The car was assembled by Hoover. And many years ago, uh, it was written um, that it was a washing machine motor. And the, the fact is, it never was. Um, it, it was a specially designed motor by Philips, uh, and it was a technical breakthrough. The last item is this rather odd shape. It looks one end of a clothes rail to, to me. Um, Adam, tell me all about it. It's a box section chassis. Clive went along to Lotus Sports Cars. And so they designed uh, this chassis 
um, which is a fantastic piece of engineering because it's immensely strong and weighs Next nothing. nothing. It's, it's, uh, well, I suppose with the battery weighing half a ton, something's got to be light. You've got to, yeah. <laughs> She said, what's his name? And I said, and she said, oh, the little car. And everybody always says now, the little car, about the, you know, the really big failure. <laughs> Which I think is so sad because there have been so many things that weren't failures. Now, the C5, I mean, the old fated C5, was nevertheless it meant to lead on to something very much more ambitious, am yes. I right? It yes. was essentially a, a four-seater, 80-mile-an-hour car with a two, three-hundred-mile range. That's it. Could you build that now, given yes. unlimited investment, obviously? Yes, that's right. The, the technology does exist. Yes, it does. The problem that we faced was that we, we didn't have the funds to, to get into a full-fledged car. The cost of, of that is, is huge. The idea was, was that C5 would be a stepping stone towards that. If that had been successful, we could have ploughed back the funds into, into what we called C15, which is a full-range car. Of course, C5 was not accepted and wasn't, wasn't uh, sufficiently successful anyway. Um, now, C15, the full-range car, uh, or full inverted commas range car, as you say, 200, 300 mile range at 80 miles an hour speed, um, was entirely feasible. We did a complete design study, and uh, that could be built today. The, um, the problem is, really, that the people who are most able to, be, to build it, the, the major car companies, um, with the best will in the world, aren't going to suddenly scrap all their, their factories and, and, and build new, uh, a completely new type of car. And, and indeed, whenever you get this sort of change, it doesn't tend to be the, the, the existing companies that, that, that create it. It has to come, really, perhaps from outside to start with. The inventor Sir Clive Sinclair has launched his latest creation, an electric bicycle. Undaunted by the failure of his C5 electric car, Sir Clive has come up with the Zyke. It has a battery-powered motor and a top speed of 12 miles an hour. The Zyke, or Sinclair Zyke, was a lightweight electric bicycle invented by Clive Sinclair and marketed by his company Sinclair Research Limited in 1992. It was financed largely with his own money. It is a portable bicycle with a small electric motor driving the rear wheel and with batteries built into its frame. It was launched on the 5th of March 1992 at the Cyclex exhibition in Olympia, London, when a prototype was demonstrated to both press and public. The price was £499, with initial production target of 10,000 zykes a month. In May 1993 press reports stated that Sinclair's manufacturer had terminated production because of low sales and that Sinclair was seeking a company to replace them. The reviews for the Zyke in the British press were somewhat negative. Potholes should be avoided at all costs, the tiny wheels just get swallowed, and lacking in any power to make a cyclist feel secure. As a concept, if it gets more people out of cars onto bikes, it's a great idea. An odd looking machine to say the least. It looks as though, it looks as though you're going to fall off it. In the end only around 2,000 units were sold. The Zeta, or Zero Emission Transport Accessory, was a simple but ingenious way of providing a motorised boost to an ordinary pedal cycle. It was first launched in April 1994 at a price of £144.95, and subsequently underwent two significant design revisions. The device is best described as a box with a roller on the bottom of it, which is clipped onto the bicycle frame with the roller resting on the wheel. The Zeta's electric motor, which is activated via a control attached to the bicycle handlebar, propels bicycle and rider along at up to 15 miles an hour. Around 15,000 units of the Zeta were sold between 1994 and its replacement in early 1997 by the smaller and lighter Zeta 2. A third generation Zeta 3 was launched in August 2000, again marking a significant reduction in the size and weight of the device. By 1990, Sinclair Research consisted of Sinclair and two other employees, and its activities have since concentrated on personal transport. By 1997, Sinclair Research consisted of Sinclair himself. By 2001, Sinclair Research was collaborating with Hong Kong-based firm Dacca. A laboratory was set up for Dacca near Croydon to develop products on a royalty basis. The Sea Scooter, an electric personal propeller for divers and snorkelers, was a notably successful addition to Sinclair's line of electric vehicles. 
The user holds the device by the handle and lets him or herself be pulled through the water at a speed of 2 miles per hour at a depth of up to 65 feet. The built-in battery lasts for about an hour and can be recharged overnight. The wheelchair drive unit, or WDU was released in 2002, and was a joint venture between Sinclair Research and DACA. It was an extension of the principles used for the Zeta bicycle motor. Although self-propelled wheelchairs are increasingly common these days, the WDU provides an inexpensive way of retrofitting old-style wheelchairs with a power assist. A motor unit is positioned at the back of the frame. This drives a wheel which when in contact with the ground, and is powered by a small battery pack attached to the frame of the wheelchair. Throughout Sir Clive Sinclair's career, from his beginnings of circuit boards, amplifiers, pocket radios, calculators and computers, which made him a great success. It was the C5 and the electric assisted motors that weren't greatly received, and through that period of his life he was consistently hounded, often being ridiculed, to a point where Sir Clive made a decision, never to speak of them again. When he was asked, his reply would just be, I don't remember. These days people are wanting electric vehicles, electric assisted bicycles and even now motors, to be attached to existing ones. The common question that is still asked today is. He was ahead of his time. What would have happened if he made them today?